Good day. This is Bill McLeod from Winnipeg, Canada. I want to speak on the subject of fears unlimited. I'd like to read 2 Timothy 1 from verse 3. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day. Paul is speaking, and he's talking about praying for Timothy, a younger son of the faith. Greatly desiring to see you, be mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, that's the genuine faith, that's in you which walk first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in you also. Wherefore, I remind you that you stir up the gift of God which is in you by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be not partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, and has brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Fear is unlimited. A problem in every land, every culture, every age, every person, everywhere. And there are many fears. The fear of man, Proverbs 29:25. The fear of man brings a snare. You know, I think there's more souls lost eternally through the fear of man than through any other one thing. I also believe that there's more opportunities lost to Christians to serve God through the fear of man than through any other one thing. The fear of man brings a snare. Matthew 10, 28, Christ said, Don't fear those who kill the body, but have no more that they can do. But rather fear him who after he has killed his power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. All right, the fear of man. We have to deal with that. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Yes, deal with it. Don't be walking around fearing what men, men will think or say or do. Fear God, fear God alone. Then there's a the fear of death. Hebrews 2, 14, 15, it says, For as much as the children, that is the Christians, as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that's Jesus, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage, the fear of death. Christ came to deliver us from that, so we'd be delivered from that fear, that bondage, the fear of death. Second Timothy one ten says, Christ has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light, to the gospel. He tasted death for every man. There's a verse in Proverbs that says that in the way of righteousness is life and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Anyway, the fear of man, then the fear of death. Don't be afraid of dying. Uh, somebody said, I'm not afraid of dying, but I am afraid of the process. Well, let's not be afraid of the process either. Let's give ourselves totally to God. So no matter how death comes, we understand, you know, death is called one of the gifts. Let no man glory in men for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Not only is life a gift, death is a gift too, because death ushers us into the presence of God. Fear of the future? Well, Isaiah 21, you know, it speaks about Upon the earth, distrust of nation with perplexity, seeing the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's fear of the future. Luke 21, 25, 26. And then fear of the past. Be sure, Numbers 32, 23 says, Be sure your sin will find you out. You may get through the whole of life, and done many evil things. You may have killed somebody. You got away with it. You were never caught. But listen, in eternity, you'll be brought face to face with the person you killed. What will you say then? How will you handle that? Keep that in mind. Fear of the past? 
evil pursue sinners, we're told in Proverbs 13 and 1 Timothy 5, 24. Some men's sins are open before and going before the judgment, and some men they follow after. But be, be sure your sin will find you out. Joseph's brothers hated him. They were going to murder him. Then they decided to sell him, make some money on the deal, and they did. And he was gone. They never saw him for 20 years. They never, I suppose they thought many times about him. And when they came to Egypt for, for food, they didn't know the man they were talking to was their brother. And he overheard them talking. And they were hearkening to the fact that they had sinned against their brother years before. And God was bringing them to count, to account for this. It may be the fear of the past. Something in your past that needs to be made right, dear people. Make it right. Make it right. And you'll have peace with God. Peace with others as well. Make it, make it right. Then fear of the devil. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out 70 lay people to go into the towns where he was coming and let them know he was coming. And they were told to do th two, uh, two things. Preach the kingdom of God. And then they were to heal the sick. Now they were not apostles. We never hear them of them again. Seven of them. He sent them out. Now, when they returned, here's what they said. Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through your name. And he said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. That's a quotation from Isaiah 14. And then he said this, I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy. That's two different words in the Greek language for power. The first word is exousia, which means authority. I give unto you authority over all the power. The Greek word there is dunamis, from which you get the English word dynamite. Satan has power in the physical realm. We have power in the spiritual realm over all the power of Satan, is what he's saying. And he went on to say, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You afraid of the devil? You shouldn't be afraid of the devil. Nothing can hurt you. Just trust God. Commit that to God also. Numbers 23.23 that it simply says that there's no enchantment or divination, no witchcraft you can use against the people of God. And that's true today. Then maybe it's fear regarding your health. Psalm 103 says, God forgives our iniquities and heals all our diseases. I don't know why it is in evangelical circles. We all believe that he forgives all our iniquities. I mean, we make a big deal about that. He forgives all our iniquities. And we're sure about that. He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. They're all forgiven. God has blotted them out. There's a song we sing. God has blotted them out. I'm happy and glad and free. God has blotted them out. I'll turn to Isaiah and see. Chapter 44, 22 and 3. He's blotted them out and now I can shout for that means me. So we have no trouble believing he's blotted our sins out. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Why don't we believe the other half of the verse? He heals all our diseases. And major question mark comes up. Do you mean he heals all our diseases? Well, let me say this. Paul prayed three times about some physical problem he had. He wasn't healed. I'm sure he prayed in faith. But God told him no, and God told him why no. And God will do the same for us today. If you ask to be healed and it doesn't happen, he doesn't want you to be healed, he'll tell you why. We can depend on that. Okay, regarding health, Job 3.25 says, The thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. Sometimes we're sick because we're afraid of getting sick. You know, they, uh, they put some rats on a steel table which had an 8-inch uh, wall around it so they couldn't get off the table. But this table could be tilted, and they would tilt the table, and then the rats, they couldn't climb up the tin surface, and they'd be just frustrated, trying by the hour to climb up the surface. They couldn't do it. And in every case, after two weeks of this kind of a test, all of these rats developed cancer. So frustration, fears, very bad, watch out. He, f he forgives all our iniquities. He heals all our diseases. You know, in South Korea, 
when somebody in one of the churches is sick, uh, 20, maybe 15 or 20 Christians go to his house, they have a time they sing, they have a time they pray, then they lay hands on the sick person, pray for him to be healed, and in 99 out of 100 cases they're healed. That doesn't happen here because when we're sick, the first thing we do is reach for the telephone. We don't, we don't pray, we reach for the telephone. And that's not right, you know. We're so afraid of standing on the promises. Fears of accident, Exodus, Ecclesiastes, rather 12, 5. They're afraid of that which is in the way, and they're afraid of what is high. He's talking about older people. And uh, I remember a friend of mine talking about their father. At one point, they said, if they got over 60, he'd be saying, watch your speed, boys, watch your speed, and all of that. And he, and he taught them to be careful drivers. But when he got older, when they got up to 50, he'd say, boys, that's fast enough. That's fast enough now. And, of course, that's what I say in Ecclesiastes. When you get older, you don't like high, climbing a ladder. You don't like being high up. And you don't like speed in the highway. And then, you know, there's what we might call fears regarding our plans. Saul and Jonathan. Saul was hiding under a tree with 600 men. Jonathan had nobody with him but his armor bearer. And Jonathan got tired of sitting around doing nothing, so he put on a little fleece, and God answered his fleece, and he and his armor bearer went up to a Philistine stronghold and uh, slew some 30 men. In the meantime, Saul is still sitting under the tree doing nothing with 600 men. And so sometimes, you know, our plans are not right. We have to thank God when you're making plans, Okay. Do you have financial fears? Well, God said, you have robbed me, this whole nation. You're cursed with a curse because you have robbed me. If you're not giving God one-tenth. Listen, I had a friend. He was in Chile as a missionary. The area he was in, he told me, he said, you know, those people were the poorest people in the world. I never saw anybody as so helplessly poor as they were. So he said, you know, I never preached tithing to them because... I thought, I can't lay that added burden on them to give God one-tenth of the very little they have. So I just never told them. But here's what happened. One day, a new convert, and the, he said, you know, Lyle told me, he said, you know, that convert, he was the poorest man of them all. And he came to me and he said, you know, Brother Lyle, I've been reading here in the Bible about tithe. What does it mean? Well, he said, it, it means you're to give God a uh, dollar and ten. He, he spoke in local language, of course, regarding money. And, uh, but he said, that's for those who can afford it. No, no, the fellow said. That isn't what it says here. It says the tithe is the Lord's. And if I'm not giving the tithe to God, it's his. And this guy started to tithe right away. One egg and ten. One egg and ten. You know what happened? In two years, he was the best off person in the congregation. And so, so much so that the other men had a meeting with him. They said, no. You're doing something we don't know about. What is it? And God is blessing you financially. He said, well, it's called tithing. And what's that? And he explained it. They all began tithing. Do you know what happened? Within a year, they were able to support a pastor. Before this, they were getting money from the states to look after their pastor. They found that they could support their own pastor. And not only that, began helping to support a pastor in another congregation. Financial fears? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Luke 6.38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over. Shall men give it to your bosom for, with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. If you measure largely when you give, you'll get that in return is what God is saying. My wife and I, when we first started preaching 65 years ago, this is the year 2007, and um, we were getting $30 a month as a salary and a free house. And we started tithing, giving the tithe and the offering. Immediately we took it off the top, always. We've done that all our life. And God has blessed us, I can tell you that, without going into details, but over and over again, the way God took care of our needs over the years. And we raised five children. Well, really six, we have one in heaven and five on earth. We have 19 grandchildren, 33 great-grandchildren, and the end is not yet. Listen, you can never lose by giving to God. Financial fears... You shouldn't have them as a Christian, but don't rob God. 
fears regarding your plans, we've gone through that. Fear regarding the unknown, known. Without our findings within, we're fears, and sometimes they're nameless fears. We can't even put a name on them. I remember one week when two girls, unknown to each other, they didn't come at the same time, but the same week, and they were filled with nameless fear. They said, we don't know where, what it's all about. We're just fear, fearful day and night. What were you doing at the time when this hit you? And in both cases, they were listening to rock music. You know, the, the, the lyrics, the words, and many of these rock songs are dirty words, filthy words, bad phrases. Christians should not be listening to this kind of garbage. And they were seized with nameless fears while they were listening to rock music. And no doubt, I, no doubt at all, some of you people listening have had the same problem. Get rid of that stuff. Stop listening to it. Ask God to forgive you. Then we have a fear that God might forget us or fail us in our problems. Listen, there are 7,487 promises in the Bible. The promises of God cover anything, everything that may ever happen to you. Believe him. All things work together for good to those who love God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It says in James chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 10. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's the pure water of the word of God. All right. God will never forget his promise. In Hebrews chapter 10 it says he is faithful but promised. You know, two old men had the same promise from God that he would give them a child of their own. One was Abraham, the other was Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. So what happened? It says of Abraham in Romans chapter 4, he didn't stagger at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. And it says about his wife that she conceived seed I was delivered of a child when she was past age because, listen carefully, because she judged him faithful who had promised. How does Zacharias handle it? How can this be? How can this be? And what happened? He was struck deaf and dumb. If you read the whole account, he was struck deaf and dumb for months until the child was born. And then this was restored to him again. I mean, he had the same promises. Matter of fact, he had more promises than Abraham had. And so remember, he gave us 7,487 promises. I haven't counted them, but Herbert Locker did. And has them indexed and cataloged in the book on the promises of God. Okay. Are you afraid of the darkness? You know, some people have come to the bed every night before they climb into bed, you know. I remember one time we put a security system in our house because we had a couple of break-ins, so we established a system. And just half one of our daughters was staying with us that particular night. Uh, she lived many miles away. She was a high school teacher in the Indian Reserve. And uh, she told us in the morning, she says, you know, I was awake all night waiting for that thing to go off. A little while ago, my wife and I, we were in bed. It was about 2 in the morning when suddenly the alarm went off. Somebody broke in. We jumped to our feet and uh, grabbed the phone to make a phone call if we had to. And we went turn out. Nobody was there. We could see both the front door and the back door. And they were both shut, it seemed. But in looking closely at the front door, I could see that it was partly open. So I went down to it. So that maybe somebody's downstairs. But there's no noise down there. I put the light on went downstairs. There was nobody downstairs. And here's what had happened. We had failed to lock either the outside or the inside front door that day, that afternoon. We hadn't gone out there and not locked it coming back. And since the outside door was open a little bit, there was a strong wind blowing from that direction, and it blew the inside door to the point where it sounded the alarm. It was quite simple. But we had a big laugh when we saw what had really happened. But don't be afraid of the darkness. The Bible says about darkness, the darkness and the light are both alike to God. The night shines like the day. There's no such thing as, you know, midnight darkness with God. The night is always shining. The light is always shining in the presence of God. The cure for fear? 
1 John 4, 16-18 says there's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. The only perfect love we know is the love of God. God is love. And there's love in everything he does. And there's no fear in love. There should be no fear in your heart when you understand the love of God. Trust. There's a verse that says, What time I am afraid I will trust in thee. Well, there's a better verse that says, I will trust and not be afraid. Oh, okay. Psalm 56, 3, Isaiah 10, 2. Well, now, Psalm 34, Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. He alone can deliver us from our fears. Then the Holy Spirit. We read the verse, 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's not a spirit of fear. He's a spirit of power and of love and of a sound, a healthy mind. You have that spirit living within you if you're born again. And the Bible says righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalm 85, 10. He will speak peace to his children, it says in Psalm 85, 8, but let them not turn again to folly. You turn back to folly, to sin, and you lose your peace. Righteousness and peace, they belong together. It says so in Isaiah 32, 17 and 18. All right, maybe you don't have peace because you aren't righteous. You are not right with God. Ask God to search your heart and show you, is there anything there that's grieving his Holy Spirit? If there is, deal with it. For, confess it, forsake it, make things right where it's necessary. And then seek the face of God. Isaiah 8.13 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. The Bible speaks about the fear of Isaac. Isaac's fear was God. Your fear should be God too. So 1 Peter 3.15 says, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That is, make God the king of your life. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Whatever fears you have, bring them to God. Ask God to forgive you for being afraid. I will trust and not be afraid. Remember? Oh, listen. God wants to deal with these things and give us peace. He'll do it, dear ones, as we get get low before God. When you're through, I'm through the message now. Listen, why don't you, as soon as you can, maybe you're driving a car down the highway, pull off to the side of the road and have a little time of prayer and cry to God. Ask him to search your heart. Confess and forsake everything he shows you. You know, sometimes people say things like this. They'll say, you know, I've asked God a hundred times to search me and he's shown me not a thing. I know there's something there. I don't know what it is. When people say that to me, here's what I say to them. Well, who's lying? You or God? What do you mean? They say, I'm not lying. Well, is God lying? What are you talking about? So I explain something from the book of Job, and here's how it goes. He never, God never withdraws his eyes from the righteous. That is, he never takes his eyes off his children. But with kings are they in the throne? Yes. He establishes them forever, and they are exalted. And then there's an if. If they be bound in fetters and held in cords of affliction, then what? Then he shows them their work, and their transgression that they have exceeded. And he, he commands them to return from iniquity. So, God says that he'll show us what our work, what our sin is. He'll show us that. So don't tell me he didn't show you anything. You just weren't listening. Your heart was, re was really not open to him. But listen, get alone with God. Ask him to search you. Confess everything God may show you. And leave it with him. God bless you. Amen.